What darkness might the family of a young competitive gymnast be hiding? Megan Abbott is here to talk about her latest thriller, You Will Know Me. Thrillers, they're supposed to go to the dark places. And so I think it's sort of a safe space for writers to sort of go for the jugular. Fiction aside, are stories of true crime addictive? Our intrepid crime colonist, Marilyn Stasio, said she had trouble looking away. God, I don't know what this is about. This is real. And then I started reading and I got the the hang of it. And I realized that everybody is an addict. Also, literary news, summer books you loved, and what we at the Book Review are reading. This is Inside the New York Times Book Review. I'm Pamela Paul. Megan Abbott specializes in finding the creepiness where there seems to be love, trust, and comfort. Her latest is set in the cliquish, high-stakes world of competitive gymnasts. It's called You Will Know Me, and Megan Abbott is here with me now to talk about it. Hi, Megan. Hi. Thanks thanks for for, having me. Thank (laughs) you for being here. So uh, tell us the premise of your latest book. The idea was I'd always wanted to write about a prodigy. In this case, it's a gymnastics prodigy. And I was always interested in the parents of prodigies. So this is from the point of view of Katie, the mother, and she and her husband, Eric, are very invested in their daughter's gymnastic career. And she is now a teenager, and she's hitting that point, which it's going to, you know, is she going to be an elite gymnast? Is she going to go to the Olympics or not? And then something bad happens <laughs> um, that kind of throws everything um, into, into question and sort of shakes up the the gymnastics community of which they're such a big part. And why did you want to write about a prodigy? I always, I had read the Andrew Solomon book, Far From the Tree, yep. which is about all these different exceptional children. And it was, I'd always been sort of fascinated by it. And it, I was just thinking about how power operates in families with special children, especially a prodigy and how, how love works and ambition and uh, particularly interested in recent years, how it's often, sometimes it used to be the mother, the stage mother, but increasingly it's the mother and the father. And so then it becomes this whole family effort. So, And then there's often a sibling. In, in Far From the Tree, there's examples with siblings that's sort of not a part of that. And so all of that, families are complicated no matter what, but it seems like it throws everything into really high relief. All right. You set that up at the beginning of your book. You have Devin, the gymnast, the 15-year-old gymnast, and then her younger brother, Drew, and you kind of set yes. that yes. dynamic up. Yes. It's interesting, too, because um, the whole idea of parenting prodigies and, and the way that affects relationships, because how much of it is the is the parents and how much of it is the prodigy. Right. And how would you ever really know? I think about that a lot, even with my, you know, I grew up reading constantly because my, my parents were big readers. And sometimes I had this experience last week where I was thinking about this. Well, what if my, what if, what if I didn't, wouldn't have liked books if my parents didn't? I mean, it's sort of impossible for you to imagine because all I do is read. But, uh, uh, you know, I can't really tell because it was just part of our life as long as I can remember. Were so, your parents writers or professors? Yes. Or? My father's a professor and a writer. And my mom is a writer. So it was sort of, it was everywhere, you know. And of course, it could have been a choice. I didn't have to do it. But it was so ingrained in the way we operated, you know. And that's what we talked about all the time. If only there were really reading prodigies. I don't feel like <laughs> yes. there, there really is such I a know. thing. Well, I guess you don't get better at it. You kind of plateau. Right. right. You, know? <laughs> you learn to read early, I guess. And then yes, there, that's it's right. the same old thing Keep after that. <laughs> and I take it you didn't play gymnastics or do gymnastics. I guess you don't play gymnastics, do you? I, uh, not what anymore. Because it's become such a serious <laughs> sport. Do gymnastics? <laughs> yes, I guess you could play it tumbling. But, uh, um, <laughs> well, you know, when I was little, gymnastics was not quite the thing it was. But I, I could not do it at all. I couldn't do a cartwheel. I, I really couldn't even do a somersault. And uh, But I remember very young watching Nadia Comaneci uh, in the 70s at mm-hmm. the Olympics. And she was so serious and so beautiful and stern. And uh, she was such a dynamo. And it's the first time I remember, other than a movie star, seeing a young girl be famous. And, and such power, too, yes. that's not sexualized. Exactly. And just in poise. And, and there was something enigmatic even about her, which I think we really read a lot into the face of the gymnast, you know, especially if they're not wearing the, even when they're wearing the smile. But, you know, it seems like they know things because of these things they can do with their body. Right. I like that you use the word scary, too, to describe her, because there is something frightening about 
girl gymnasts. What is it? I think, you know, it, they seem to be doing something that defies nature and logic and physics right. <laughs> and all these things. And yet they're they're sort of always girls. We, even when they're women, we still tend to call them girls. So this is weird space they occupy between girl and woman and and you know feminine and traditionally masculine in terms of the muscles they have and then they wear this sort of the American gymnast starting to wear this all American smile but you kind of know it's fake just like you know that the fake that I have a friend who calls it the hate hug when they hug each other after <laughs> when the teammates hug each other after a stunt because there's a lot sort of aggression in it because they're competing so they seem it seems like there's a lot of dualities to the gymnast and what interested you specifically in competitive gymnastics? There was a moment, you know, I was deciding between, you know, ballet and, you know, I was trying to think about what the sport would be. And I thought about uh, ice skating. But 2012 Olympics uh, was going on right when I was thinking about the book. And I remember there was this viral footage of Allie Raisman's parents that became quite famous because they were watching her perform and they were so into it. And they they were wincing and the mom had had her knees up to a chest and they were fist pumping and they were so invested in it and they seemed like such a team like you couldn't separate those parents you Mm -hmm. know Uh, and that seemed like the most fascinating dynamic to me and then everybody criticized them for it and accused them of being you know stage parents and which I thought was kind of sad because you know I think it's more complicated than that you know so that was sort of you know once once I landed there I thought gymnastics uh, would be the way to go and the book is in in large large part also there's a lot of commentary about contemporary parenting in the book. Yeah. So, you know, I think parents, you know, can't win these days in some ways. You know, there's so much encouragement to be involved and invested and get your kid in the right schools and do all these activities. But then they're criticized for being helicopter parents and, you know, and perhaps some parents are too invested. But there there doesn't seem to be any, you know, there's no line, you know, and um, it's hard to sort of argue that parents shouldn't do everything they can for their child's dream, you know. So the the question of whose dream it is 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 probably one that's impossible to answer. So you went into this book, you knew you wanted it to be a prodigy, you knew you wanted an athlete, then you knew you wanted it to be gymnastics. Did you know the ending? Do you know the ending when you start a book? I do. I know the ending. Sometimes it changes, but usually then it changes back again. <laughs> I have this sort of, I do a sort of three-act structure in my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I know what's going to happen in the beginning, the mid, the midpoint, and the ending. And then everything else kind of changes. So I knew what the crime would be, you know, and I knew what would happen because of the crime at the end. Uh, um, but everything else kept changing. I, the, the sibling drew, the, the little brother. I, I didn't think he'd play such a big role as he did, but I grew to like him. And so he became a bigger role. Did you then go back and kind of rewrite that beginning and sort of set it up so that he was more visible there? Yes, I did. I did. And in some ways, he rem- he reminded me. My brother was a, a very intense athlete when I was a child. He was a, a baseball player. And I remember being... But could he read as well as you did? He could not read. He, well, we did sometimes have contests. He could do sports and read, unfortunately. <laughs> not. But I remember watching him in the bleachers all through my childhood. So then I sort of started to think about Drew, the brother, in that way, what that would be like, mm-hmm. you know, um, and what it's like with a parent, uh, you know, maybe not paying as much attention to that child. So then he be, he became bigger. Um, and, and so that changed. But the ending was sort of always there. I always wonder, like with, with authors of psychological thrillers, because I, I'm a fairly amateur reader of the genre. I love it. But when I read it, I fall for everything, every fake, you know, every false lead. I fall for it 100%. And then I'm like, Oh, they were, you know. <laughs> and also just like the doling out of the crumbs of information. I mean, how do you do that? That is very hard uh, uh, because you don't really know it yourself. That you requires that's the way you really count on your editor because you know everything so well that you no longer understand what suspense means or what surprise means. But you do. I always think. I think Raymond Chandler says something about this. The rule for me that I go by is that the ending should maybe should be momentarily surprising, but then ultimately it should make sense to the reader. So you don't want to do a cheat, you know. And I always hated mysteries where it felt like a cheat. Like, well, you know, if I knew that this person had this secret code to this underground chamber, then, you know, like that kind of thing. It's kind of like obeying the laws of of an imagined world. That's right. That's right. And and if you or if you show just going from suspect to suspect and then you just sort of pick one to land on. So I always wanted to have a kind of psychological truth to it. And so then the reader would still be surprised, but it would feel 
feel like the right place in some way. I often think, too, about that Alfred Hitchcock rule of suspense in filmmaking where, you know, you can have two people um, sitting at a table and suddenly a bomb goes off and, you know, momentarily the viewer is shocked. Or you could show the viewer that there's a bomb ticking under the table and have the two people talking about baseball for this, you know, long protracted scene. Yeah. And that that, you know, ends up being more shocking in the end that they, you've sort of given the reader or the viewer something that they know. Do exactly. you think about it that way, too? I do, because my books, t- it's one of the reasons I've never done a detective or a cop novel, uh, because I prefer to be with the criminals or with the people who are close to the criminals. So because of that way, because then you're kind of in on it with them, mm-hmm. and I like making the reader be in on it, you know. I always loved crime novels that were sort of confessional, like the old James M. Cain ones, like Double Indemnity, where, where the book itself is a confession. And I think that is true. Like, you, you may lose one kind of suspense, but you gain all these other kinds. And then you're sort of you become like the criminal, because inevitably you want protagonists to succeed in some way, even if you find them repellent. And I, I kind of love that. Do you feel like you kind of get caught up in that, even just as the author, as you go along? In some ways, yes. Well, probably in all ways, but uh, <laughs> because often the guilty. character... Yes, and guilty as charged. Um, I think often the characters that I mean to be... I don't really have villains, but mean to be somewhat of antagonists. I always end up liking. And then... So then I try to give them other qualities, and then I try to make the reader kind of like them, and then things get sort of slipperier from there. And I've always liked those books, too, where, you know, it's just sort of... It's like the Kane mutiny theory, where, you know, there's secret heroes in in every book, and sometimes they're not the ones you think, so... It's interesting that women um, crime writers are sort of... I think drawn to especially these psychological thrillers um, and using them as a kind of like commentary on society. Yes, I think in some ways it's sort of the safe space to to do it. And I think, you know, I I think a lot about Gone Girl and its tremendous success in that way. And it it sort of told you about everyone's marriage. (laughs) Right. it, you know, for better for worse. I mean, everyone has dark moments in marriage, you know, but it was felt so illuminating. It was like this, like readers were thinking, it's okay to have these bad thoughts sometimes. (laughs) And and I think you could get away with that in a thriller in a way that might be trickier in another genre. Um, Thrillers they're supposed to go to the dark places. And so I think it's sort of a safe space for writers to sort of go for the jugular. This is your ninth novel? It's my eighth. It's your my, eighth. I have a one nonfiction book on, on uh, a film noir. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so your eighth novel. Do you, with each book, sort of set up a challenge for yourself and think, okay, in this book what I'm going to do is – a little bit different, or it's X, or yes, yeah. Sometimes it's point of view, uh, and sometimes it's a different kind of character. And oddly, I mean, I've written several books from about teenagers. Um, the last few uh, earlier books are about grown women, but this book was the first grown woman, contemporary woman, point of view that I had written, and the first mother. So I knew I wanted to do that. I mean, sometimes it's it's sort of more imaginative goals than that. But for this one, I really wanted to. I'm not a mother myself, so I really thought it would be interesting to. to to ponder that and uh, so I do try to do that just to keep things changing and different for myself. If you could have the ideal sort of imagined reader who reads this book and what their response is they come up to you and they say like wow Megan Abbott in this book you really X what would they say? Yeah I guess you know I guess it would be to have sort of greater sympathy and understanding for the complexities of of young female ambition, Mm -hmm. which I find we still struggle with as a culture, uh, teen sexuality, teen female aggression, but certainly teen female ambition, which still, other than maybe the ambition for celebrity, um, everything else somehow still seems to feel unsafe. And so I would love it if uh, someone, they wouldn't necessarily want them to follow the path of the characters in the book, but but to think that uh, ambition can be exciting and thrilling and empowering and, and awesome. <laughs> all right, fan male writers of the future to Megan <laughs> yeah. Abbott, you know now what to write. But I'll take them all. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, thank you so much. Thank you so much. The book is, again, You Will Know Me by Megan Abbott, reviewed this week in the book review by Sophie Hanna. Alexandra Alter joins us now to talk about what's going on in the book world. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Pamela. So what is going on? So the biggest book of the summer, and perhaps the year, is actually a play. And for once, it's not Hamilton. This time, it is Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. This is a play that's opening on Saturday in London, and Scholastic, 
J.K. Rowling's publisher, is releasing it as a book, just the script. And they've already decided there's enough demand to print 4.5 million copies. Ah! Huge first printing for any book, but for a play, I think it's probably unprecedented. And Harry Potter fans are having midnight release parties across the country. There's at least 5,000 of them planned at schools and libraries. So they're acting like this is the eighth installment in the Harry Potter series, which is sort of interesting given that J.K. Rowling didn't write it herself. She worked on it with a, with a playwright, uh, Jack Thorne, and with a producer, John Tiffany. So it's not exclusively her work. She didn't even conceive of sort of the setup but she did approve it, and she did uh, weigh in uh, at many points. And so for some fans, this seems like if it has her blessing, it's part of the canon. So people are very excited. Now, is Bloomsbury releasing this in the U.K. simultaneously? Yes, it's the usual global midnight release, heavily embargoed. Booksellers told me they can't even open the boxes. It's the usual kind of high-security multiple country release. Now, the play is opening on Saturday, but reviews came out this week. That's right. It's been in previews, and the reviews have been, I think, almost uniformly ecstatic. People said it's, you know, you hate to use the word magical, but that is the word that people are throwing around. As a theatrical experience, it's apparently uh, just sublime, and they've. it's in two parts, and the setting, it takes place 19 years after the Battle of Hogwarts for Harry Potter fans. So it really picks up from the epilogue of the last book. Harry is an adult. He is a civil servant. He's an overworked parent, and he's seeing his son off to Hogwarts now. And then I think there's some flashbacks, possibly time travel, although they've kept all the plot really under wraps. So the theatrical experience, people have really been responding to it. It will be very interesting to see how that translates to the page. Of course, you don't have the performance. You don't have the staging. You'll have stage directions, but it's not this fully realized world that J.K. Rowling has brought people into. You know, I think people are used to her imagination kind of filling in all the details. And because people are so familiar with the characters, they'll probably be able to fill them in on their own. But it will be really interesting to see, especially how kids take to reading a script, which is such a different experience. Um, I heard yesterday from a colleague um, that her daughter's summer camp, which ordinarily does not allow package deliveries at camp, is making one exception for those who want to send their children a copy of the new Harry Potter. They will be allowed to open those care packages, which I thought was great. That's fantastic. Now, if people want to see the play, I know it's sold out in London uh, until May. Is that the entire run, or will it be running after that? They have indicated that they're, they would hope that it would travel abroad, so I would be very surprised if we don't see a Broadway performance at some point. Now, this is just one part of this year's J.K. Rowling multimedia excitement, because there's a movie coming as well. There is. It's Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which is her kind of extension of the Harry Potter universe into North America. And she dropped this on her website a while ago. She's been keeping fans engaged despite having ended the series officially. She's been writing short stories on Pottermore, and one of them was exploring the history of magic in America. And Scholastic will be publishing the screenplay in the fall for Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And J.K. Rowling wrote this script herself. So I'm curious to see if fans are equally excited or more excited, given that this, these are her words on the page, unlike the play. It'll be interesting to see what the first printing is, if we have another series of midnight release parties, or if a lot of the excitement is sort of focused on the play this summer. The 20th year of Harry Potter continues. Coming up on the 20th anniversary, amazingly. Oh, and we should add, there is a fully illustrated version of the Chamber of Secrets coming out in October. There was the, the first one in these uh, newly... Full color illustrated editions came out last year with um, Harry Potter and uh, the Sorcerer's Stone, and this uh, October brings the next one in that series. Yeah, and that's another example of how smart Scholastic has been in keeping the series going, even though it ended, you know, in 2007. They've been doing new editions, illustrated editions, coloring books, new covers. Every year there seems to be a new iteration of it, and for the hardcore fans, they'll get it in every format available. 
Are your kids Harry Potter fans? Actually, I have two hardcore fans, um, and I am obnoxiously taking them to London next month to see the play. Um, and my youngest, who's already sensing that, that this is something to resent, uh, is currently reading The Chamber of Secrets. I'm sort of <laughs> half reading it aloud to him, and he's reading parts of it alone. So um, I'm sure he'll be bitter uh, come September that he have didn't get to see it. Have you taken to the theme park yet? We have not been to the theme park. We have been. I've been with one child to the studio, and I'm taking the other two. We're all three going when we're in London uh, next month. So we're doing the full, the hardcore Harry Potter uh, tourism. Uh, what are your Harry Potter plans, Alexandra? Well, I will not be going to a midnight release party because I have two small children, and I'm usually asleep by then. Are they not <laughs> of Harry Potter age? <laughs> not, I don't think quite. Six is the oldest, so... I think uh, she'll be coming up on it soon. In that case, I will be getting involved. Your time is coming. (laughs) All right. Thanks, Alexandra. Thanks, Pamela. John Williams joins us now as the voice of our listeners. Hi, John. Hi, Pamela. So we are talking about people's favorite memories of summer reading. Yeah, we've been doing this throughout the season so far, and we've been hearing from a lot of you with great short stories about your memorable summer reading experiences, whether it was this summer or 20 or 30 years ago. We're looking for 30 seconds of the book you read and why it made such an impact on you. You can record a voice memo and send it to podcasts at nytimes.com. And we've got a few more to listen to this week. Let's hear one. Hi, my name is Jason Ramsey, and I live in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My summer read story took place last summer. I decided to read Stephen King's 112263. I was enthralled by the novel and I was really sad when it was finished. But it wasn't finished. I walked out of my office the next day in downtown Hamilton and there was a banner across the street that read Dallas welcomes the president. There were old timey de- police cars with the word Dallas written on the door and there were lots of people dressed in 1960s clothing walking around. I thought that either I had lost my mind or I had traveled back in time to 1963. Then I saw the cameras and James Franco and realized that they were making a movie out of the novel. I was both relieved and a little disappointed. I would have still have been freaked out God, to have just finished a novel and then to walk into a movie set of it? Incredibly surreal and bizarre. And as many listeners may know, places like Toronto and its environs often uh, fill in for places like Dallas and other cities. Right. Uh, Toronto is in every movie. Exactly. It's cheap. Here's another reader. My name is Rissy Lundberg, and I'm a math teacher in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. One summer when I was a child, my family took a trip to see another family at their lake cottage in northern Wisconsin. And while I was there, our hostess pointed to the other room and said, wow, Rissy, my daughters really know how to enjoy their vacation. And when I looked in the room, I saw that they were reading. And this was the first time I realized that reading could be enjoyed as a pleasure activity. And I have been a leisure reader and a summer reader ever since. That's very sweet. That's sort of a a general sentiment about... (laughs) you know, the the summer revelation that, that reading can be fun. I know. I kind of think that schools assigning summer reading is an evil concept because it basically turns it into something completely unfun. Yeah, that keeps you indoors when you want to be outside. Well, I want it to be indoors instead of outside. I think we have one more this week. All right. Hello, my name's David Eccles from Melbourne, Australia. And the summer reading that changed my life was Robert Cormier's The Chocolate War. It was a book we were going to read in middle school. And I was 14 years old and I read the jacket cover and then completely read the book from front end to back. Uh, And it changed my life because uh, I was getting bullied in school and so was the lead protagonist in the story. And it taught me to stand up for what I believe in and never give up. Thank you. Did you read that book? I did a really long time ago. And when he said it, it jogged my memory, but not enough to really remember the details. I remember that book and I Am the Cheese, for some Mm -hmm. reason, always associated in my mind together. I think they both were at least Newbery Honor, if not medalists. And I would look at them at the public library and I would think those books are for boys. 
And not for me. Oh. Maybe I was wrong. Well, you changed your mind, certainly, eventually. Yes. Uh, it's funny. We haven't heard from a lot of people about childhood reading memories when you think that that's kind of the time when reading changes your life the most and they're the most memorable. So anyway, we're still waiting to hear from you. So you can send your 30-second voice memos to podcasts at nytimes.com. And if you don't know how to record a voice memo, we can help you at nytimes.com slash books with an article on how to do it. And just so you know, we love these. We love listening to them. And we can't play all of them, but we really appreciate everything you're sending in. So thank you. There are those who like their crime to be pure fiction and others who only want the real thing. Fortunately, for the second kind of reader, there are lots of books for them this summer. The Book Review's crime columnist, Marilyn Stasio, has done some serious investigating on your behalf. Marilyn, thanks for being here. Happy to be here. All right. So you are normally on the fiction side of things. Um, it's kind of shocking to me, but you'd never really read true crime. Not much of it. I mean, I always think of myself as a uh, fiction addict. So how did it feel to dip into real murder? Mayhem? Well, it was scary, frankly, because I had said to you, oh, sure, I can do that. You know, old war horse here, I can do anything you want. Just tell me. But then I realized, God, I don't know what this is about. This is real. And then I started reading and I got the the hang of it. And I realized that everybody is an addict. The people who write them, the true crime books, are addicted to the field. And obviously, the people who write the books are nuts. Would you say the same about crime? Of course. About the fictional crime? Of course. That's why I related. I finally said, oh, I know where I am. I can do this. They're all just like me. We sent you a whole number of books, and you picked six. I'm going to run through the titles, but how did you narrow it down? Was it easy? Was there a lot of good stuff? Or The first one I picked right off the bat was True Crime Addict because I figured, well, that will tell me all about it. You know, it will tell me, it would lead me off into a field I don't know by explaining to me why people get addicted. The next thing I did was I naturally grabbed... <laughs> <laughs> the Victorian ones, because I love the Victorian crimes. And Victorians are so good at crime. Aren't they fun? Yes. I especially like the one on the poisoning, because what this was, it was an, it's an academic book, much more so than any of the others. In All fact, right. it's probably the only one. That's The Secret Poisoner, A Century of Murder by Linda Stratman. That's right. It is, as I say, it's academic, and it was studying the period from that particular point of view of poisoning and poisoners. And I realized, oh, man, this is fascinating because it's all about the period. And the poisoner represented a real threat to the society because the poisoners were, for the most part, women. And the women were voiceless, powerless, clueless. They had no laws until, what was it, 1870 or something. They started getting some women's rights legislation. And so they killed. <laughs> and poison was a great way to do it. Everybody was doing it. Any little boy with a penny could walk around the corner to his neighborhood grocery and, and buy some arsenic. So pre-suffrage, this was women's secret source of power. Yes, nicely put. All right. The books, I want to go through the titles very quickly, and then we can talk a little bit more about each one. So the first one you mentioned, True Crime Addict, How I Lost Myself in the Mysterious Disappearance of Maura Murray. And that's by James Renner. Let's talk um, a little bit about that. Um, I guess the title is, is he uses this one case to kind of explain why he's interested in true crime? Or? Exactly. And why he picked this one, I don't know. But what was really funny about it is that he got into the field because he scored on a psychological test in the same level as Ted Bundy. And his psychiatrist shrink or whoever, you know, conducted the test said, oh, don't worry about that. You know, you may have a killer's uh, mentality, but that's okay. Why don't you just write true crime? So he picked up on it. He's the author of The Serial Killer's Apprentice so uh, and a few <laughs> other books. So it sounds like this is not new um, to him. Another book, um, going back to the Victorians, our favorite Victorians, uh, among the ones you reviewed is The Wicked Boy, The Mystery of a Victorian Child Murderer by oh, Kate Summerscale. Wonderful book. Absolutely marvelous. Well, I love her. 
Kate Summerscale wrote a previous book that I also reviewed. So the minute I saw this one, I grabbed it. The beauty of this book is that, again, like all of them, they're writing about a larger phenomenon. They're writing about something in the age or the something special that they use that particular crime to illustrate. And this was all about what the Victorians really thought of children. They were terrified of them. They hated them. They thought they were little savages. What is it? Havelock Ellis has a wonderful quote about their little savages and monsters, and you have to beat it out of them to civilize them. And what this is really about is an imaginative boy, and his younger brother, who has no imagination compared to him, the problem is that there is a murder involved. Right. But if he didn't murder his mother, you would just love this child because he, um, his imagination was inflamed by the Penny Dreadfuls. Now, I can relate to that. I mean, those were the trashy novels of the day, and they were written specifically for little boys. The boys were poor. And they were stuck in the slums or in not very happy lives. And they had nowhere to go. And they had no prospects. There was nothing ahead of them. So they lost themselves in penny dreadfuls. And they read these great adventures that took place overseas. And they became heroes in their own minds. That's what this particular wicked boy did. He got carried away by all these adventure stories. And did he blame his the matricide on the Penny Dreadfuls, or was that his lawyer, no. or was that the newspapers at the time? That was public opinion, and his trial was clearly brought out the worst in the Victorians. They just were terrified. His very own father said he had too much imagination. He said he had too many brains to fit into his skull. And what is it that uh, Kate Summerscale does especially well in this book? Well, she uses a specific crime to make much broader points about so many different things. I mean, just for example, when this boy was on trial, people were so outraged that he had killed his mother that it was brought about because of his reading habits, society immediately called for the uh, repeal of the Education Act. I think it was 1870. Reading is bad for you. Yes. Isn't it wonderful? It turns you into killers. It, it inflames your imagination. And that's really what got her interested in this case, is that the boy was an imaginative little boy and his imagination was lit on fire by the books he was reading. And when he was caught and brought to trial, society knew exactly what was going on. And what did they call for? Not only his, you know, locking him up, but they wanted to get rid of education for the lower classes. Well, let's continue with those charming Victorians because you, <laughs> you, you did do a, another Victorian crime book, Pretty Jane and the Viper of Kidbrook Lane, a true story of Victorian law and disorder by Paul Thomas Murphy. What's the story behind this oh, book? Oh, so sad. Again, it's illustrative of something about Victorian society that needs attention, and that obviously caught the eye of the author, and that is servants. The servant classes had no voices, no nothing, especially the girls, the women, the young girls. They went into service at 12 years old. They were seduced easily and quickly by their masters. There was a, a newspaper editorial that ran during her trial that said, oh my Lord, it was awful. It said she was a servant girl, serving her master the way servant girls have served their masters for time immemorial or something like that. I'm paraphrasing clearly. Shockingly, that is what people believed. The servant classes were meant to serve their masters, whatever mm -hmm. horrible thing they were asked to do. Well, it became even more of a social issue. Because the servant classes, picking up on this, made her their heroine. Hmm. There were protests in the streets. There were, you know, I mean, they really made a noise about it. And they were furious. 
So at the end, she was vilified, absolutely vilified. I mean, I would have killed him. He was a gross man. I mean, he practically raped her and uh, he seduced her in the way that masters seduce their servants. But in the end, it was only those friends of hers who had to say something nice about her, and I had to do it on her gravestone. All right. The moral of the stories I'm drawing here, at least based on these last three books, is not to oppress women, children, or servants, or they will kill you. I love it. (laughs) All right. Let's go quickly to the other two books, very different. Morgue, A Life in Death by Vincent DeMaio and Ron Franskel. Well, I chose that because I wanted to have something of the science I don't want people to think that it's all storied and that it's all uh, entertainment because this is very entertaining. The Morgue book, not so entertaining, not particularly well written, but it's loaded with very specific information and it's technical information. It's forensics. Um, Do you think crime novelists should be reading a book like this? (laughs) So they, well, that's all they read. Where do you think they get their information? Did you feel like you were going to like the source material in a lot of these books? I did, actually. What about the last book, The Dragon Behind the Glass, a true story of power, obsession, and the world's most coveted fish by Emily Voigt? This sounds uh, like on the margins of true crime, probably. No, no, no. It's criminal. It's criminal. These people were killing each other, and the Japanese Yakuza's were killing people to get these fish. They were What are these fish? Why do they want them? Because it's rare and it's hard to find and it's I mean it's the same thing with the uh, tulip craze. That's why I chose that book because it's about obsession. It's so much of what we read and oh this is such a confessional thing to say. I think I'm obsessed. I think a lot of my readers are obsessive. And that puts us in the same world somehow as obsessive collectors, obsessive murderers. You know, it's all we all share some kind of obsession. Look at collectors. There's a an exhibition somewhere in town at the yes, new museum yes, on the we just Bowery. Did a story in that. Yeah, and it's wonderful. I can't wait to get down there. And it shows that we are all collectors. We're all obsessed with one thing or another to one degree or another, to the fact, to the degree that it makes us criminal. Um, You know, I don't think we're all necessarily in that category. But the ones who do do criminal things, and there are a lot of criminal things done, done in that book. You know, I mean, the amounts of money that they pay. But what interested me about that was that the author became obsessive Mm -hmm. and followed in the in the course of her I guess it's her research into why people were so crazy about this fish it's the Asian arowana or dragon fish arowana the dragon fish and it's both ugly and beautiful it's beautiful because of the colors and it's ugly because I guess it's ugly I mean, it's got toothy tongue. It's ugly because just look at it. Yeah. Just go and Google that fish, that dragon fish. (laughs) But do not Google arowana eats bunny. Okay. Or duckling. You've been warned. Did you have a favorite among these um, six books, Marilyn? It's clearly Kate Summerscale and The Wicked Boy for so many reasons because his wickedness is that he became obsessed with fiction and adventure stories and crime, and that's me. (laughs) The other thing is she really is a superb writer. But Marilyn hasn't killed anyone yet. Not yet. In my dreams. Marilyn Stasio, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Greg Coles and John Williams join us now to talk about what we're reading. Hi, guys. Hey, Pamela. Hey, Pamela. All right, let's talk first about what the other people are reading. Greg, <laughs> what's new on the bestseller list? Um, you know, the usual. Uh, there's a new Delia Efren novel, Syracuse, that's uh, down at number 16, about um, a couple of marriages falling apart on vacation. 
Uh, then Jane Green, the British writer who now lives in Connecticut, has a novel called Falling, which is about a British woman who now lives in Connecticut. <laughs> that, that's new at number 15. Uh, Joseph Finder, the thriller writer, continues his Nick Heller detective thriller series. Uh, the, I think it's the third book in that series. It's called Guilty Minds, new at number 14. And then jumping all the way up to number four, um, another British writer, a um, mystery writer who's really kind of following in Agatha Christie's footsteps writing these kind of classic locked room type mysteries, has a novel called The Woman in Cabin 10. Her name is uh, Ruth Ware. Her novel is The Woman in Cabin 10, which is about a um, journalist on a cruise in the North Sea uh, who thinks she has witnessed a murder, but nobody else believes her. The victim is not recorded as a passenger on on the ship, um, and uh, nobody thinks that she really saw anything, and and they try to convince her that she's going crazy. So that uh, is new at number four, The Woman in Cabin 10 by Ruth Ware. And on the nonfiction list, it's election time. It's election time. The conservatives are making themselves known. All three of the new books uh, this week on the nonfiction list, um, one is about um, the efforts to defeat radical Islamist terrorism. It's called The Field of Fight by a a retired general, Michael T. Flynn. He wrote that book with Michael Ledeen. That book is new at number 13, The Field of Fight. Then up at number four, the political strategist Dick Morris and his wife Eileen McGann have a book called Armageddon. This is also cheerful. <laughs> so uplifting. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's kind of in keeping with the tenor of, um, well, at least the Republican campaign this year. And then at number two, Dinesh D'Souza, um, who back in 2012 had a bestseller called Obama's America, now has a bestseller called Hillary's America, um, looking at... What America would be like if Hillary were to win. How about you, John? What are you reading other uh, than the Dinesh D'Souza? <laughs> right. I put that down for now. And I'm about halfway through Weathering Heights. So I'll have my final verdict next week, I think. And in the meantime, I devoured, because it's very quick read, this book called The Examined Life by Stephen Gross. He's an American-born psychotherapist who practices in London. And this was published three years ago here. Um, uh, I, I love this book. Yeah. It, it's a series of really short, like three or four page scenes from these different cases he's had over the years. And it's kind of an Oliver Sacks case studies type book, um, except from the psychoanalytical perspective. Yeah. Of and, and less bizarre. I mean, there are a couple <laughs> of bizarre twists, but mostly it's just people with fairly normal problems and you know moments of epiphany that they had. Sometimes the epiphanies, especially as they relate to things like the meanings of dreams, seem a little too neat to me but the fact that they're so short means that you just every time you finish one you're just ready for the next setup of the next person's problem (laughs) you feel like you've solved every each person yeah (laughs) a little bit and it's very compulsively readable and it's just a real menagerie of human you know if you have any problems right now this is a kind of encyclopedia of the different things that people go through and it can make you feel i think a little less lonely i feel left out i feel lonely because you both have read this and i haven't (laughs) maybe i'll borrow that it's a very quick read okay Greg, last week I was reading James Baldwin because I wanted to read Norman Mailer and couldn't find the book, I, the, the his convention book that I had in mind. Um, and so I turned to James Baldwin, who wrote about Norman Mailer. So uh, this week I read Teju Cole's new essay collection, and he writes about James Baldwin, <laughs> um, especially in the context of Black Lives Matter. It's uh, His essay collection is far-ranging. Teju Cole is a far-ranging writer. Uh, specifically the, the essay that I read from that book, sort of continuing what I did with Ford Maddox Ford. You, you finish something and then you kind of poke around and, and read about it. And um, so I read Teju Cole on James Baldwin. And now I'm reading William Maxwell's novel, So Long, See You Tomorrow. Oh, very one of my short, oh, very I love spare. William it's a, Maxwell. It's a yeah. beautiful novel. What's funny, I had not read this novel before, um, but I, I've read quite a bit of Per Pedersen, who wrote Out Stealing Horses mm-hmm. and I Refuse and I Curse the River of Time. And William Maxwell, th- this book specifically feels like a template for all of Per Pedersen. It opens mm. with a violent event that he leaves a, kind of a mystery. It's, it's a shooting of a tenant farmer. And then it backs up to trace the story of a childhood friendship um, that will eventually reveal um, kind of what led to this shooting. And that is, it, in a nutshell, what Per Pedersen does in all of his books. So, you know, the instigating violent incident and then backing up and looking at this uh, kind of nostalgic, spare, um, beautiful story of friendship. I've never read Per Pedersen, but I'm surprised you hadn't read The Maxwell. That strikes me as a very Greg-like book. And there, <laughs> it, there are moments in that book where he kind of he gets into the mind of this dog in a couple of scenes, which I think some people really don't like, but I thought was actually really brilliantly done. And it's very spare and short and beautiful. I would highly recommend that yeah. to everybody. Have you read They Came Like Swallows? No. That's uh, a very autobiographical uh, novel that uh, Maxwell wrote about the flu of 1918 um, and the deaths of 
various family members. And that book, actually, I read after reading the excellent New York Times obituary um, for William Maxwell, mm-hmm. which I recommend people go back and read that obit because it was really great and, and gets you into... Uh, going, going back into the obits archives is so much fun. I, I just randomly, a few weeks ago, had reason to look up the our obit for the Australian writer Janet Frame, who had a very odd life and career. Oh, and yeah. That was really... Um, in, enlightening and entertaining. So this is what the New York Times Book Review does for fun. We look <laughs> through the obit archive. Other than obits, what are you reading, Pamela? I was rereading a little bit um, a memoir by H.L. Mencken, My Life as an Editor and Author, which is something I read a long time ago, but I dipped back into it. Um, and it's just a lot of fun, and it makes you wish that you were an editor and author back in the day, uh, going to Delmonico's for lunch. And, you know, there there's this great part where he, um, he reprints um, letter exchanges that he had with James Joyce, oh, wow. where James Joyce is abroad and, and hasn't even seen the American edition of Portrait of the Artist, and is asking him, you know, can you try to get this over to me? It's during World War I, um, so that's not mm-hmm. easy. Also includes some fun disparagements of later Joyce novels, which H.L. Mencken was not a fan of <laughs> Ulysses, um, so that's always kind yeah, of fun but he to loved read. Finnegan's Wake. Yeah, and no. No, one knew, <laughs> no one knew how to insult like H.L. Mencken. World-class so disparager. That's right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, Pamela. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. Our producer is Jocelyn Gonzalez. And you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul.